All right. Something that I never knew was that I knew there were some dictators around the world. Sure. But did you know that some of the dictators now apparently, allegedly, are drug addicts as well? That might explain a few things. Hugo Chavez now admitting in a speech yeah. that went widely undocumented, by the way, that he chews cocoa every morning and he also eats something called cocoa paste, I think which, it's by the way, is addictive. And he gets it from cocoa. the dictator in Bolivia. What did you say? Coca. It is coca. Oh, coca. Coco. Oh, coca would be fine. Listen. <laughs> I don't know my I don't know my narcotics as well. well as see, I it's a shame. For a moment, Gretchen, when you just said coco, uh, I, I'd imagine people all across America just spin up coco puffs. Yeah. Wait, they thought they were going to get a high out of it today. Yeah, I'm, I'm an Ovaltine guy, but that's for another time. Uh, but what you're saying is, I'm re I read that too, and then it, they were people. I guess the reporters went on to define what is he talking about. He gets his cocoa paste. Coca. Coca. Oh, I got you. Going down you take a from Bolivia dictator. Is he a dictator too? Millions of people watch these shows consistently, night and day, throughout North America. Do they believe what they see? I hope not. But even the more serious end of the networks and print media in North America and Europe followed the lead of the Bush White House and divided the world into friends. That is, leaders who do what we want them to do, and enemies, leaders who tend to disagree with us. Raul Castro and Venezuelan dictator Hugo Chavez, a declared enemy of the Bush administration. I think that we have to view at this point the government of Venezuela as a negative force in the region. This is the new Venezuela, being built with its own revenue from petroleum. Caracas is one of the showplaces of the Americas today because wise use has been made of the nation's income from oil, approximately half the profits on all petroleum sales. The national policy is to sow the petroleum back into the nation for physical construction, new industry, and public welfare. After all, we made one recent huge mistake in Iraq, and it seems to me the worse the lie, the more often it gets repeated. We do have solid evidence of the presence in Iraq of Al-Qaeda members. With the help of the media's repetition of the Bush administration statements, more than 70% of Americans polled were convinced that Saddam Hussein was involved in the massacres of September 11. Is there a smoking gun here? It, it, smoking gun is an interesting phrase. The smoking gun that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Why are we here? We're, that's the that's the question. Why are we here in this war? Where's the weapons of mass destruction? Well, why didn't you? Why did? What did it? Why did it take you so long, Wolf, to finally take on Vice President Cheney? It took you to 2007 those, before you made the man those mad. Are, at those you. are fair I mean, questions. It, and, uh, I saw I saw Dr. Sanjay Gupta over there embedded with the troops at the beginning of the war. He and the others of you in the mainstream media refuse to ask our leaders the hard questions and demand the honest answers. And that's why we're in this war. We're in the fifth year of this war because you and CNN, Dr. Gupta, you didn't do your jobs back then. And now here we are. In this mess. The same strategy as Iraq was applied to the upheavals in South America. The electoral victory of Hugo Chavez, despite his many critics, was a triumph for Venezuelan democracy. But there is a problem with democracy. As practiced in the South, it can throw up politicians who refuse to accept the dictates of Washington. In the eyes of our leaders, the elected leader of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, was and is a dictator. The world's worst dictators, Hugo Chavez. The Venezuelan president has become more dangerous to the U.S. than Fidel Castro ever was. Exxon Mobil says it's been ripped off by Venezuelan president Hugo Chavez. The Latin American strongman. There is such a thing as a killer clown, and he may be it uh, in Latin America today. Hugo Chavez is, uh, is uh, a dictator. These rogue dictators like Chavez. If you said, do you hate Hugo Chavez or Fidel Castro, I'd say, I hate those guys. In the very front of the book, you quote Otto Reich, who is the uh, former uh, ambassador to Venezuela back in the 1980s, is saying that he's more dangerous than bin Laden, and the effects of Chavez, his war against America, could eclipse those of 9-11. Chavez is supporting terrorism on a daily basis, is doing nothing about drug interdiction, supports Iranian nuclear ambitions, North Korean mm -hmm. nuclear ambitions, works with the Syrians. He's given al-Qaeda and Hamas an open invitation to come to Caracas. Who is Hugo Chavez? Where did he come from? The fall of the Berlin Wall 
and the collapse of the Soviet Union was seen by millions as an end to all alternatives to capitalism. Washington seemed gripped by a triumphalist arrogance, as if thinking, now we can do whatever we want. We're going to take a closer look at a mysterious presence on the international scene tonight. That's how the International Monetary Fund describes itself. The International Monetary Fund is a powerful financial institution that has 186 countries as members, but is controlled overwhelmingly by the U.S. Treasury Department. Its support for governments in low- and middle-income countries is often considered crucial to political survival. The IMF tries to help maintain a stable global economy through the orderly flow of money between countries which have different currencies. The biggest challenge to Washington's newfound dominance came from South America, a continent the IMF and Treasury Department had often used as a guinea pig in their economic experiments. In 1988, the Venezuelan economy was a mess. Real wages were plummeting and poverty had been rising for years. The Venezuelan government went on its knees before the IMF. The latter obliged, but dictated a structural adjustment program which guaranteed more pay, especially for the poor. When bus fares were raised in February 1989 in accordance with the IMF agreement, Caracas exploded in a fiesta of rioting and looting. Police in the Venezuelan capital Caracas opened fire again today on demonstrators who were throwing rocks. This is the fourth day of violent protest at the government decision to raise prices on some very basic consumer items. The government called out the army. Hundreds perhaps thousands of Venezuelans were shot dead. They killed my son, cried this woman at a Caracas city morgue today. Anxious relatives checked names on a partial list of more than 200 people reported killed. The morgue is literally overflowing with the bodies of the dead. That same month, a group of young officers met secretly on the initiative of then Lieutenant Colonel Hugo Chavez and condemned the massacre and pledged that it would never happen again. Chavez didn't sort of drop from the sky. He was produced from within the army when the army was used to massacre its own people. Chavez and a whole group of junior officers met and said, this is not what we were created for. I mean, a military should, its only purpose is to defend the country from outside invasion. Exactly three years later, in February 1992, Chavez launched an unsuccessful rebellion to topple the government. But the general strike that had been promised never happened. The government of Venezuela dodged a bullet when loyalist troops put down a violent midnight coup attempt. Up to 70 people were killed. Rebel troops failed to topple President Carlos Andres Perez. Y la gran noticia que le traigo a todos los venezolanos es que fueron dominados todos los focos y están detenidos porque se rindieron o porque fueron vencidos. Chavez was arrested and in prison for two years. He publicly accepted responsibility. Compañeros, lamentablemente, por ahora, los objetivos que nos planteamos no fueron logrados en la ciudad capital. Es decir, nosotros acá en Caracas no logramos controlar el poder. Y yo, ante el país y ante ustedes, asumo la responsabilidad de este movimiento militar bolivariano. Muchas gracias. There is no question the coup was illegal and against the very tenets of democracy that Chavez would later defend in the coup attempt directed at his government. On the other hand, it must not be overlooked that the majority of the population did see Chavez as a hero. Y puedo decir a plena seguridad de que esta será la última vez que en Venezuela se presenta una situación como esta. There were celebrations in the capital of Venezuela tonight after the Supreme Court ordered that the president, Carlos Andres Perez, must stand trial on charges of embezzlement. He's accused of stealing 17 million dollars in government money. By 1997, Chavez decides to run for president. His main opponent is a six-foot-one blonde former Miss Universe. 
uh, the contest becomes known as the Beauty and the Beast. The former Miss Universe is mouthing sugary platitudes while Chavez is preaching revolution. And that is what the people wanted to hear. In Venezuela, the presidential election Sunday could lead to a sharp left turn in the government. His supporters called it a punishment vote. It brought this man to power in Venezuela. A former military officer who has said he will fight against a tradition of corruption and economic inequity. In 1998, four years after his release, as inflation rates in Venezuela reached 70% and the government made more cuts in social spending, the political establishment had been completely discredited. Despite the opposition of the entire media, Hugo Chavez was elected president. Why is someone who staged a bloody coup just six years ago so popular among the people? 40 años, we resent 40 years of criminals dressed up as politicians. He had promised far-reaching reforms to raise the living standards of the poor, enhance democracy, and share the oil wealth of the country with those who had never benefited from it in the past. Over the next three years, Chavez proclaimed Venezuela a Bolivarian Republic and began to fulfill his promise. Statues of the beloved Simon Bolivar, the liberator, look out on his birthplace, Caracas. He led six South American countries to freedom. Ah, Bolívar. Bolívar era una, es una foto como de Bolívar de, en la plenitud de su gloria. ¿eh? A lo mejor Bolívar, a lo mejor Bolívar es Bolívar en el Perú en toda, toda su en toda su gloria, ¿no? Alguien dijo, Bolívar pensaba en siglos y miraba en continente, miraba continente. Por segundo día consecutivo, altos funcionarios del gobierno de Washington expresaron su preocupación por la situación política en el país. We have been concerned with some of the actions of uh, Venezuelan President Chavez and his understanding of what a democratic system is all about. Obviously, Venezuela is important because they're the third largest supplier of petroleum. Um, I would say that Mr. Chavez, and the State Department may say this, probably doesn't have the interests of the United States at heart. Chavez's reforms provoked fierce resistance from the country's oligarchy. They controlled the Venezuelan media and used it to foment opposition. They also mobilized support within the military and received help from the United States and Spain. Pienso que lo más razonable para el señor presidente de la República y su gabinete es que o presenten voluntariamente su renuncia o bueno o desaparezcan del país. A businessman, Pedro Carmona, was chosen to be the new president. He supposedly flew to Madrid to be measured for a presidential sash. El golpe contra Chávez tuvo un motivo, petróleo. Oil. Bush planificó. Primero, Chávez. Chávez. Petróleo. Oil. Segundo, Second. Saddam. Hussein. Saddam Irak. Hussein. Iraq. La causa de la, del golpe en Venezuela. The cause of y de la invasión a Irak. The coup in Venezuela and the Iraq invasion. La misma. It's petróleo. Oil. On April 11, 2002, groups of Chavez supporters, as well as members of the opposition, were demonstrating in different parts of the city. Later, opposition demonstrators decided to march through the city towards the presidential palace where the Chavez supporters had gathered. He wants us to become a Cuba. He wants this to become a communist. Nazi. There is no doubt about it. As they neared the palace, Suddenly, shots were fired from the rooftops of buildings and members from both sides were hit in the head. On a nearby bridge, the Chavez supporters took cover and returned fire in the direction of the snipers. 
as well as at the Metropolitan Police, who had fired at them two blocks away. The local media coverage of this event showed the Chavez supporters firing from the bridge and then showed the street where people had been hit in the head by snipers. Manipulating the footage to make it appear that the Chavez supporters had fired these lethal shots. The media would also say that Chavez himself had ordered these shootings and used this as justification for the coup which was already in progress. In the end, this is what triggered the overthrow of Hugo Chavez. Armed gangs loyal to the Venezuelan president firing on thousands of anti-government protesters. After 16 people were killed and hundreds wounded, last night soldiers surrounded the presidential palace. Mr. President, I was loyal to you, the head of the army said on national television, but the killing of Venezuelans today was intolerable. I was actually down below the bridge at the time uh, and, uh, and saw that the street was completely empty when the shooting was going on. Uh, when I got home and saw CNN and other news media reporting this, I was really shocked. It's a coup d'etat. They are saying that it's not a coup d'etat. It is. It was a coup d'etat. He was taken into prison by the army. Yo le vi el rostro a la muerte. Estuvieron a punto de matarme. Allí, fusiles apuntando por delante, por detrás, y yo discutiendo con ellos, recordando al Che Guevara, que dicen que murió de pie. Y yo por dentro diciendo, no voy a implorar perdón, ni clemencia, voy a morir parado. Much of the U.S. media welcomed the coup. The New York Times editorial board wrote, Venezuelan democracy is no longer threatened by a would-be dictator. This reference to Chavez ignored the irony of what was actually taking place at the hands of a real dictator. Se suspende de sus cargos a los diputados principales y suplentes a la Asamblea Nacional. Se destituyen de sus cargos ilegítimamente ocupados al presidente y demás magistrados del Tribunal Supremo de Justicia. Al defensor del pueblo y a los miembros del Consejo Nacional Electoral. Y dirigentes de Acción Democrática introdujeron ante el Tribunal Supremo de Justicia una declaratoria de insanía mental del presidente de la República, Teniente Coronel Hugo Chávez Frías. La media en Venezuela became essentially a part of the opposition in the months leading up to the coup. That is, they were actively participating and supporting the opposition. And of course, I'm talking about the private media, which is most of the media in Venezuela. And what they were doing essentially was uh, to uh, broadcast every single opposition statement that was made. I mean, many analysts even said afterwards that this was the first media coup and actually um, one of the main participants in the coup even said that we have the media to thank for this coup. Gracias Televen, gracias CMT, gracias Globovisión, gracias medios de comunicación. La ex candidata presidencial Irene Saez exhortó a la comunidad internacional a participar en esa transición. Hoy yo estoy pidiendo al gobierno de los Estados Unidos y a todas las Naciones Unidas y a la OEA que la OEA enjuicie este proceso criminal en Venezuela, que, que han matado gente inocente y que todos nuestros gobiernos apoyen el proceso democrático verdadero que vive hoy el país. The IMF, usually slow in responding to genuine requests for aid from starving Africa, was quick off the mark to demonstrate its support for the coup. I hope that these, these discussions could continue uh, with the new administration and we stand ready to assist the new uh, administration in uh, whatever manner they find uh, uh, suitable. The aim was straightforward. The IMF was making it clear to the world that the toppling of Chavez was in the interests of global capitalism. And there's reason why Washington is almost certainly smiling. We import more oil from Venezuela than any other OPEC nations. Oil prices dropped sharply today with Chavez's departure. The reason why prices are coming down so dramatically, more than likely, whoever replace, replaces Chavez is going to be a lot more friendly 
to United States interests than this previous president was. Tú pregunta por qué no me mataron. Me mandaron a matar. Solo que yo soy un soldado. Yo pasé media vida en la Fuerza Armada y los militares venezolanos, sobre todo los más jóvenes, me ven como su líder. But as news spread of what had happened, the poor dramatically marched to the palace in huge numbers. And soldiers even told their officers that they would not back the coup. Se cerraron y me protegieron. Y luego me rescataron en la isla. Los paracaidistas con los helicópteros. Yo soy líder paracaidista y allá fueron mis paracaidistas y me trajeron otra vez al palacio, rodeado de pueblo. Carmona had to flee the palace. El cardenal llegó a, al sitio donde me tenían, a la isla, a pedirme que firmara la renuncia. Y es porque desde Washington estaban pidiendo la renuncia firmada. Le dije, vamos a rezar, le dije, vamos a rezar porque vienen a rescatarme. Se asustó. Estando él ahí, llegaban los paracaidistas. Well, he was there, y luego yo me lo traje a él en el mismo Cardinal helicóptero. Then, Le dije, venga. Sí, me dijo, vamos a rezar, presidente. Said, yes, let's pray, president. Why did they do such a lousy job of it? It was a dinky uh, coup. I mean, why did they kill him when they had him? It wasn't heavyweight, you know, the way they did it. Compared to Guatemala and Chile and Argentina. La Venezuela del año 2000, 2002, no es la Guatemala del 54, no es el Chile del 73. It's not Chile of 73. Esto es una revolución. This is a revolution. Yo lo he dicho. And I've said it. Pacífica. Peaceful. Pero armada. avanzando con calma y con cordura. Sigue. The New York Times editorial board seemed embarrassed for supporting the coup and its government. The White House today admitted that U.S. officials held several meetings with Venezuelan opposition leaders in recent months to discuss the ouster of President Hugo Chavez, but insisted at every turn today that not once did they signal a military option was acceptable. We explicitly told opposition leaders that the United States would not support a coup. On Friday, it appears they did just that, embracing Chavez's successor at the same time U.S. allies in the region condemned what they clearly saw as a military coup. When Chavez was returned to power the very next day, the White House looked like it had sided with coup plotters over democracy. Some Democrats today call that deeply troubling. I think it's incumbent upon the greatest democracy in the world to defend democratically elected governments. I don't think that the United States had a very enlightened policy towards Venezuela specifically or Latin America generally throughout the Bush administration. But this particular incident was the worst possible decision the United States could have taken. It not only uh, locked in eternal enmity from the Chavez administration, but it made it very difficult for anybody else in Latin America to like the United States. He says that the coup that took place in his country was engineered by the United States, and some in his administration say that, in fact, you had something to do with it. What, what do you say when you hear that? Well, I have to laugh because uh, the coup, first of all, there was no coup. Uh, if there had been a coup, I think Mr. Chavez would have been removed. There was a four-month four investigation by the State Department. There was absolutely no U.S. involvement in that uh, action uh, that, that Chavez calls a coup. Yes, the United States was hosting uh, people involved in the coup before it happened. There was involvement of U.S.-sponsored NGOs in training some of the people that were involved in the coup. 
And in the immediate aftermath of the coup, the United States government said that it was a resignation, not a coup, effectively recognizing the government that took office very briefly until President Chavez returned. The coup failed, but just eight months later, the management of the National Oil Company launched a strike with their workers and were joined by business owners who locked out their employees. The strike, once again supported by the private media, devastated the economy, causing a severe recession comparable to the worst years of the Great Depression in the U.S. A general strike by opponents of the president, Hugo Chavez, forced the Supreme Court to stop its work today. The oil industry in Venezuela has all been shut down. This attempt to topple Chavez failed as well. In support, the Cubans sent in 10,000 doctors and free medicines to establish clinics for the poor. In a swap Chavez made with Fidel Castro, he offered Cuba cheap oil in exchange for some of Cuba's doctors, like Niyuris Moreno. Some of these people, she says, have never seen a doctor before. The stuff Chavez claims he's done, you know, reduce poverty, was reduced much, much more under the uh, prior leaders. One of my colleagues in the State Department says that Chavez loves the poor people so much he's created millions of new ones. After the government got control of the oil industry, the economy doubled in size over the next six years, with poverty reduced by half and extreme poverty by more than 70 percent. Chavez has a very poor human rights record. The Bush administration has compared him to Hitler. Human rights has become a, a new buzz phrase, much as freedom was during the Soviet era. But even here, political double standards exist. By comparison, our closest neighbor and ally in the region, Colombia, has a far worse human rights record than Venezuela. But because President Uribe is perceived as a friend to Washington in their war on drugs, they get a pass in the media that Chavez doesn't. Chavez has made a point of appearing in public with the tyrants Washington loves to hate. We have the ability to take him out, and I think the time has come that we exercise that ability. We don't need another $200 billion war uh, to get rid of one, you know, strong-arm dictator. It seems to me from the few days I've been with you that you have a very, you've grown a very thick skin to this, but at first you must have been shocked. Me afectó. En lo personal, en lo personal, me dolía, me dolía la mentira y el irrespeto a un pueblo. Pero luego me di cuenta que es parte de un juego y que por más que yo haga, yo me puedo vestir de cura de, con, con un, un copito de esos rojos aquí. Me van a seguir diciendo, tirano, los pueblos saben la verdad. I, I understand um, Chávez's confrontational approach. After the coup, it started to feel a little bit more like war. George W. Bush, you are a donkey, Mr. Bush. Ayer estuvo el diablo aquí. En este mismo lugar, huele a sufre todavía. This is your desk. This is where you work. Este es uno de mis sitios de trabajo, preferido. Never seen such energy. Never. And then you told me you were going to come back here last night and work. Sí, anoche trabajé, mira. What time did you get to sleep last night? Was... Como a las 3 de la mañana. 3 a.m. Uh, did you work until 2 or 1? Trabajando, leyendo. Estoy obligado a estudiar mucho. Yo tengo que estudiar. Yo tengo que saber del sac. Do you have any fun? Do you ever read for pleasure? 
todo esto es un placer. Para you mean you go to sleep reading this book? I mean, how boring can you get? This is really boring. Well, the first thing to know about Chavez is that he was literally born in a mud hut and grew up in poverty. And this uh, affected his view of Venezuela as well as ultimately his lifelong mission to transform the country. Yo nací. I was born. Allá, cientos, cien metros allá. Hola. Bienvenido a su pueblo. Welcome to your town, Mr. President. Hola. ¿Cómo está mi vida? Mira, muchachito. Venezuela pasó 50 años sin proyecto. Ahora tenemos un proyecto. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Es una foto muy vieja que la recuperamos de una cédula de identidad. Ella tenía menos de 70. Producto seguramente de tanto trabajo. Aquí nací yo. Era una casa de palma. Y esta es la casa donde nos criamos. ¿Qué fue ella como en 14? Era un thin guy. And he likes to play too much baseball. Too much baseball? Uh, yeah. And what position? He used to be a pitcher. A pitcher? And he used to play the first base. And he tried very hard to win all the time. Yeah. He only likes to win. He only and likes he, to win. He doesn't like he, to lose. No, but because he, he makes too much effort to win. Think about the past, you go. Your grandmother's out behind you. Your grandmother's coming out the door. If I start thinking about that, I'll be crying. And action! <laughs> Tengo que pagar. Tengo que pagar. Coño, ¿de quién es esta bicicleta? ¿Cuántas vacas tienes ahí? Eh, 10 dando leche. Dando leche 10. ¿Cuántas producen? ¿Cuánta leche diaria cada vaca? 4 litros. 4 litros. Hay que levantar esa producción. Y es tuya, es propiedad tuya, sí. de la familia, pues. Sí. No, no. Estudiaste hasta que. No, hasta sexto grado. Sexto grado, tienes que sacar secundaria a la misión Riva. <risa> ya cuando yo llegué aquí había que importar maíz. Ya no hace falta importar no, maíz. Está, Batimos récord de producción este año. Ahora nosotros estamos instalando las plantas. La bomba atómica iraní está aquí. La bomba de maíz. El maíz sale de ahí a nuestra planta, hacemos la harina, en este caso con apoyo de Irán, y la vendemos muy barata a los pobres y al pueblo, a todos. 
Hace 200 años comenzó una revolución. Bolívar la dirigió, libertando estos pueblos de, del Imperio Español. Y comenzó el sueño de una república libre, soberana. Pero luego nos cayó el Imperio Norteamericano. El Imperio Inglés. Y partieron esto en pedazos. La historia nuestra es terrible. Este continente quiere ser. Queremos ser nosotros mismos. Yo te quiero mostrar. Luego, Oliver, I want to show you something. ¿Tú ves? Yo sí. Aquella estructura. Es un viejo cuartel. Y allí tuve yo el día de la rebelión militar. Eso fue el 4 de febrero del 92. 1992. Ese era el puesto de comando de la rebelión. Estaban tomando el palacio nuestros militares rebeldes de Caracas. Yo he podido morir ahí. Ahí murieron soldados míos. Yo estoy fuertemente conectado con los que murieron ese día. Con los que murieron aquí. En esas ventanas todavía hay impactos de, de disparos de aquel día. Esos muertos, yo los cargo aquí. Esos son parte de mi compromiso. Como soldado y como ex soldado también. Chavez's victories in Venezuela had begun to transform his own country and offer hope to others. Powerful social forces were massing in the South, cutting across national boundaries. It was as if Simon Bolivar's dream had begun to be realized. The old oligarchies, privileged, lighter-skinned, prepared to defend their status with force, and the new social movements, indigenous, darker-skinned mixtures, and above all, poor. Chavez now moved further to the left, and proclaimed that socialism was the only way forward, calling on other South American states to join in the Bolivarian Revolution. Would they? Legalizing cocaine. That's one of the central planks in the campaign of Evo Morales, a fiery leftist and consistent U.S. critic who is running for president of Bolivia. He is a man who is no friend of the Bush administration. Evo Morales, who used to run the Bolivia's Cocoa Growers Union, is the first Indian to be elected president of that country. Morales, who just last month called President Bush a terrorist, is part of a new wave of left-leaning leaders in South America. The stakes here are high. Bolivia has the second largest natural gas reserves in South America. The flight from Caracas to La Paz is a straight line down across the Andes. It was in Bolivia that Che Guevara was captured and killed on CIA orders in 1967. Forty years later, in 2005, Bolivia had, for the first time ever, elected the leader of the indigenous people, over 70% of the population, Evo Morales, as their president. As leader of the coca farmers, Morales had been imprisoned by the oligarchs. Giant social movements in defense of the coca farmers against the IMF and water privatization had woken the country. The government decided to sell the water supply of Cochabamba to Bechtel, a U.S. corporation. And this corporation, one of the things it's, it got the government to do was to pass a law saying that from now on it was illegal for poor people to go onto the roofs and collect rainwater in receptacles because that challenged their monopoly of water. There was an uprising. Unrest is growing in Bolivia. The government has declared a state of emergency after days of protest over, among other things, rising water prices. At least five people have been killed. It was movements like this that propelled Morales and his movement for socialism to power. Some called it Che's Revenge. Others saw it as the victory of truth against corporate tyranny. When we landed in La Paz, we all struggled with the altitude. It's the highest international airport in the world.
For generations, the indigenous people have chewed coca leaves to ease this strain on the body. Now, this is not the same thing as cocaine, as many in the United States are led to believe. These coca leaves must be processed chemically in order to make cocaine. But in their native form, the leaves function as a mild stimulant like caffeine. A day later, we were still feeling the nausea and the altitude, so President Morales helped us out. I'm just curious if the president would show me, you know, share with me just a little bit and show me. This coca leaf is no good. It's no good? It's no good. Oh, really? It's not good. It's not going to be good for you. Wow, you're an expert. But you do this. It's a verdecito y no negro como esta. So, uh... <laughs> Washington brought the war on drugs to, uh, to Bolivia. And, uh... President Morales kicked out the DEA uh, a couple of months ago. So, pretexto de lucha contra el narcotráfico, lo que implementa es política de control, no solamente a Bolivia, sino en muchos países de Latinoamérica. Detrás de la lucha contra el narcotráfico están intereses de carácter geopolítico de Estados Unidos. War on drugs, there are some geopolitical interests of the United States. Right. Eso, eso sí es. Control. Control. No? Así se consume, a ver. This is how you consume it. Yo lo invito y me dice en dos en los dos manos. She's going to invite you and you need to eh eso. Una vez teniendo la mano. Agarras. You hold them. Agarras de esta colita. Y What's wrong with the tail? Uh that's how you hold it. ¿Qué está? ¿Qué, qué? No solamente el control político, y en algún momento, ahora nos estamos informando, que planificaron asesinatos a líderes políticos. Miembros de las Fuerzas Armadas y de la Policía Nacional los van denunciando como durante la década pasada, como también eh, en esta década, han ido planificando a acabar con, con vidas, especialmente el mío. So two months ago, you had you kicked him out, and then the American ambassador went. Tuvieron la expulsión del embajador y en noviembre la embajada a la DEA de Estados Unidos. Yo cuántas veces he detenido, torturado, tortured, days, days, yo de ahí confinado. Tortured for what? Por acusaciones de conspiración, de sedición. Was he tortured by Bolivian soldiers or were there American advisors? Son dos bolivianos bajo, bajo la dirección de la DEA de Estados Unidos. What was the last time he was in prison? Bueno, en el 97, ¿no? 1997. Después he sido diputado, pero expulsado del Parlamento en el año 2002. Y el plan era detenerme, encarcelarme e inhabilitarme como candidato a presidente. Y fracasaron. Por primera vez no se permite ninguna base militar no extranjera. There's none now, is there? There's ¿Hay alguna ahora? Yeah, ya, ya no hay. Not anymore. Había antes. So now he's joining the uh, Hugo ranks. He's becoming more the bad left in the American media. Como los medios que van a siempre tratar de criminalizar la lucha contra el neoliberalismo, contra el colonialismo y contra el imperialismo. Y es casi normal. Acá el peor enemigo que tengo son los medios de comunicación. Could we say generally that the goal of the presidents of the region would be to own their own resources, their natural resources? Es recuperar los recursos de todos una base para las economías de los distintos países del mundo. Just in closing, how would he describe himself? Yo me siento más dirigente sindical que presidente, porque como dirigente a una lucha permanente. Permanent struggle. Y a veces aquí los ministros me dicen. Tú eres presidente, no digas eso, incluido este viceministro. Now that he's woken me up with the green leaves, is it possible we could just go outside for a second? Show me if he's awake. I don't know if he's awake. I want to play soccer with the president. Can you show me a little soccer ball action? Does he like Maradona? In football. Sí. No. 
Here's the new anti-American, Spanish-speaking Latin triumvirate, Bolivia's Evo Morales, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and Cuba's Fidel Castro, who says the Latin American geopolitical map is a-changing, and he is right. Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. This was a country that for 15 years did everything it was asked to do by the IMF, the World Bank, and the U.S. Treasury Department. In 2001, it collapsed. Banks went under. Five presidents fell within two weeks. The president of Argentina resigned today amid continuing violence sparked by a deepening economic crisis. At least 20 people have died. Mounted riot police today battled hundreds of anti-government demonstrators. A trade union is calling for a general strike to protest tough austerity measures and an unemployment rate close to 20 percent. People were in the streets. Factories were occupied. In the big park in Buenos Aires, delegates from every locality, rich and poor, met to discuss their fate. Nestor Kirchner was elected president and refused to agree to IMF conditions, forcing them to back down. After his term was over, his wife, Cristina, injected with the same Bolivarian spirit, was elected. A mí me parece que, como te decía, no por primera vez en la región los gobernantes se parecen a sus gobernados. Si vos vas a Bolivia y mirás la cara de Evo, la cara de Evo es la cara de los bolivianos. Es la primera vez que esto sucede. Eh, el presidente que, uno de los últimos o anteúltimos presidentes que derrocaron, Sánchez de Lozada, eh, le costaba hablar en español porque vivía en Estados Unidos eh, y no tenía absolutamente nada que ver con los bolivianos. Le contaba la otra vez a periodistas que me interrogaban. Dice que Hugo Chávez quiera exportar su revolución o su cambio o su socialismo a toda América Latina. Y esto no puede ser así, me decían ¿no? los periodistas europeos. De esa manera piensan los que son colonialistas, como ustedes los europeos, que han sido toda la vida coloniales y que han siempre tratado de instalar las ideas eh, que ellos tenían eh, en, otras, en otros países. Nosotros que en la región no tenemos experiencias internas de colonialismo de un país sobre el otro, al contrario, sino que hemos sido también sujetos que hemos sufrido el colonialismo. No pensamos que nadie quiera imponernos nada. Al contrario, creemos en la integración, respetando las modalidades, las identidades de cada país, las culturas y los procesos políticos que nunca son iguales en ninguna parte porque no son iguales los pueblos, porque no son iguales las sociedades y porque no son iguales las historias. Creo que no hay ninguna experiencia de los gobiernos actuales en América Latina ni en el mundo que haya tenido la cantidad de elecciones por las que ha pasado Hugo Chávez. O sea, creo que va por la decimotercera elección. No he visto muchos dictadores con 13 elecciones consecutivas. Se puede estar de acuerdo con lo que dice o no, pero decir que en, en Venezuela no hay libertad para decir lo que cada uno piensa, no me pareció en absoluto, al contrario. ¿Y, otro, veníamos... ¿Y cuántos pares de zapatos tienes? Ah, no sé, nunca los conté. Sí, oh, pero, sí, sí, yo. ¿Qué sé yo? No sé, nunca le preguntaron a un hombre cuántos pares de zapatos tiene o cuántos, o cuántos pantalones tiene. Le preguntan siempre a las mujeres esas cosas. Ay, gracias. Oh, acá estamos mucho mejor. Tráeme la foto que tengo en mi escritorio, a ver, de, del 25 de mayo del 2003 cuando asumió Kirchner. Esa, esa foto te va a gustar, te va a gustar más todavía, una foto divina. Eh, estoy con viejos conocidos ahí. Sí, sí, porque quiero ver, eh, quiero, quiero que la veas porque realmente es una película lindísima. A ver si la encontraron. Hombres tenían que ser para ser tan lentos, Dios mío. <risa> ¿Hasta cuándo te quedas? Esto es el 25 de mayo del 2003. Kirchner asumiendo, Fidel riéndose y yo que ahí estaba de First Lady. Argentina tuvo una recesión terrible entre 1998 y 2002. ¿Puedes describirnos a nosotros role the IMF played and what Argentina did to pull itself out of that recession. 
Terrible. Para salir de esta recesión. Terrible. El FMI recomendaron la oleada de privatizaciones, de no intervención del Estado, de que el mercado todo lo resolvía y sostuvo la convertibilidad para sostener esta ficción. Además, el país se endeudó financieramente en forma brutal, porque los capitales venían y eh, tenían una tasa de interés impresionante en la Argentina y luego se retiraban y bueno, y provocaron el endeudamiento más grande del que se tenga memoria en la República Argentina que llegó a estar en el orden del 160% del PBI, nos dejó eh, a un cuarto de la población sin trabajo, 56% de pobreza, 30 y pico de indigencia y en fin todo lo que puede constituir una tragedia social. Entonces, finalmente, todo estalla eh, en el año 2001 y 2002 con brutales devaluaciones que significaron una formidable transferencia de ingresos. Esta es la Argentina que recibe Kirchner en el año 2003, en el 25 de mayo, y donde nosotros entonces planteamos una política sustancialmente diferente de una gran discusión con el Fondo Monetario Internacional. That its trade policies help the rich but hurt poor workers. Today, the Argentinian president, with concerns of his own about U.S. trade policy, seemed in no hurry to embrace his American counterpart. An awkwardness President Bush acknowledged. This is not easy to host all these countries, particularly not easy to host uh, perhaps me. Many people say you played a breakthrough and very heroic role in <laughs> challenging the IMF for the first time. This is successfully. Would you say uh, one of his, one of your personal highlights of your life might have was the uh, Mar del Plata conference with Bush? Bueno, yo digo sí. Es yo creo que ese día América Latina derrotó las intenciones de la primera potencia del mundo representada por la política que llevaba el ex presidente Bush adelante. Eh, con el ALCA y actuamos todos colectivamente. Yo creo que ese día no lo voy a olvidar nunca en mi vida. Tanto que tengo el sillón de esa reunión guardada en mi casa Calafate, ese día tuvimos el coraje no de hablar por las radios cuando no está el hombre, o no está la política, o no está el sinónimo que expresa la política imperial. Y actuamos colectivamente, actuamos ordenadamente. Y eso fue uno de los pasos más importantes que hubo en la región. When you say no to a banker, what is it like? Y bueno, usted es subversivo, de izquierda, ladrón o sinvergüenza. Was there ever a moment, like in a movie, where, the, where one of the chief bankers uh, leaned across and looked in Mr. Kirchner's eyes and said, Mr. Kirchner, do you realize the implications of what you're saying? Siempre. Cuando usted ve que un político es muy amigo, muy amigo de estos sectores, es que algo no anda bien. Porque estos sectores miran por su rentabilidad, no por la rentabilidad del conjunto de la sociedad. Y ahora, en este proceso que le toca afrontar a la actual presidenta, es un proceso por demás difícil, distinto, porque a mí me tocó salir del infierno. Ella ahora tiene que cualificar el trabajo, tiene que profundizar la distribución del ingreso. Entonces los sectores concentrados de la economía, los sectores que quieren ganar siempre y no repartir nunca, los sectores que no quieren compartir los esfuerzos, son los sectores que reaccionan. Reaccionan corporativamente porque quieren seguir teniendo un país para poco, concentrado, donde muy pocos decidan por todos los argentinos. President Bush came to the summit to talk about his free trade policy that he says would help ease poverty and create jobs in the region. Were there any eye-to-eye -eye moments with President Bush that day, that night? Yo digo que no hay que ser, ni hay que arrodillarse ante el poder, ni se necesita ser eh, maleducado para decirle las cosas que tienen a aquellos que han sufructuado y han eh, juzgado a nuestras, a nuestras naciones. Se genera una discusión en Monterrey y yo digo que acá la solución para generar rápidamente, ¿qué es la solución que hay que hacer ahora? Dije a Bush, es un plan Marshall. Y se paró de la silla y se enojó. Me dijo, no, plan Marshall, no, eso, esa es una idea loca de los demócratas, me dice. Y que este, el, lo que hay que hacer acá y la mejor manera de dinamizar es... Y, y Estados Unidos ha crecido en base a las guerras, me dijo. Así me lo dijo. Bueno, le digo, es un crecimiento... Eh, eh, dijo, dijo eso, textuales palabras. Es decir que... Este, well, is he suggesting that South America go to war? 
bueno, eh, decía que Estados Unidos, nunca bueno, dijo de América del Sur. Que Estados Unidos, que era un error de los demócratas, que, que todo el crecimiento económico que había tenido Estados Unidos había sido en base a las distintas guerras que tuvo. Es decir, este, en la forma que a él le gustaba hablar fue clarito, ¿no es cierto? En eso no lo puedo dudar que fue clarito. ¿Sabe que Bush es, este, el presidente Bush, eh, todavía es? Bueno, quedan seis días, ¿no? Yes. <laughs> His job down here is being complicated by Hugo Chavez, the socialist president of Venezuela who today took the unusual step of leaving the summit to rally demonstrators in a nearby soccer stadium. He said he wanted to bury the free trade agreement. Alca, al carajo. From Argentina to Paraguay, where a former bishop, Fernando Lugo, and liberation theologian defeated the incumbent and brought the decades-long rule of the pro-Washington Colorado Party to an end. This is General Strasser's old palace. This is his uh, dictator mansion. My family was persecuted by Stroessner. My father was 20 times in the prison of Stroessner. It seems a paradox that I'm in the place where I live. I can imagine. These changes in Latin America, these last 10 years, which are amazing, Amazing, especially since 2003, 2004. Are these the result in any way, do you think, of the liberation theology that goes back? Sin ninguna duda, ¿no? Nosotros creemos que América Latina, las raíces del cambio real, eh, comienza con una manera nueva de pensar. Hace 15, 20 años nadie pensaba que un indígena puede ser presidente, que dos mujeres puedan ser presidente en dos países importantes, que un metalúrgico pueda ser presidente, que un militar y, pueda ser presidente, y menos aún que un obispo pueda ser presidente. Yo creo que aquí hay un nuevo actor político que son los movimientos sociales. Pero la oposición viene efectivamente de los grupos que históricamente han tenido los privilegios aquí en el Paraguay, especialmente después de 61 años de un partido hegemónico, no ha sido fácil el cambio aquí en el país. Aquí hay un grupo que se ha privilegiado históricamente del gobierno, de los, de los recursos del Estado. Nosotros somos coherentes con la opción de la teología de la liberación. Si aquí tiene que haber privilegiados, tienen que ser los históricamente olvidados, los indígenas, los sin tierras, eh, los sin educación y sin salud, que son los, eh, los, los, los que hoy deben ser los primeros en atención los cambios son de tener una administración honesta, transparencia, que las instituciones recuperen su dignidad y un crecimiento económico pero con mucha equidad social. No me puedo despegar de 30 años de acción pastoral dentro de la iglesia y nosotros también decimos, uno es el que siembra, como dice San Pablo, otro es el que riega, otro lo hace crecer y otro los cosecharán después. Sí. Tenemos 2.300 millones de dólares. Chávez le dio a Argentina, ¿qué es? ¿6 billones de dólares? Argentina, 6 billones. Para que no vayan a la deuda. Chávez les va a hacer esa loan si hablo con él. ¿Cuánto es? ¿Cuántos años tiene usted? 57. Él tiene tiempo. Él tiene 30 años. Tiene tiempo. Bueno, Fernando Lugo, eres un hombre muy gentil. And I think a very good man. I wish you great good luck. Muchísimas gracias, ¿eh? Coming time. Esto realmente no lo vamos a olvidar nunca. In Brazil, the changes were more political than structural. Lula da Silva has been elected president of Brazil with the largest margin of victory in the country's history. Mr. da Silva is the first left-wing working-class president in the country's history. He was a labor union leader and a political prisoner when the right wing ran Brazil. Brazil has the ninth largest economy in the world and is deep in an economic crisis. The Bush administration supported his opponent. But the president was Lula, the working class leader. Lula may not have directly confronted the IMF, but he did refuse any Brazilian complicity in the planned destabilization of Venezuela or Bolivia. Now serving out his last term as president, I found him combative like his early self. E muitas vezes aqui na América do Sul nós tivemos governantes subservientes. Muitas vezes aqui e também uma elite subserviente. Tudo que era americano era bom, tudo que era europeu era bom, tudo que era japonês era bom. Tudo que era nosso não prestava. Eu aprendi na vida sindical que um interlocutor 
só respeita o outro se ele se respeitar. Então, eu pessoalmente não tenho nenhum interesse de brigar com os Estados Unidos. A única coisa que eu quero é ser tratado em igualdade de condições. Eu lembro que quando eu chamei o presidente rato do FMI para dizer para ele que eu ia pagar a dívida, ele não queria que eu pagasse. Não, fica com o dinheiro aí, não precisa pagar. Eu falei, não, eu, eu, quero, eu quero quitar essa dívida. Quitamos a FMI, quitamos o Clube de Paris, não devemos nada a ninguém e temos 207 bilhões de dólares de reserva. Is there a possibility of a bank of a union in the of South American financial interest? Is there like a European Union? Is it possible? Vejo. Yes, I do. Vejo e trabalho para isso. Com a Argentina, Argentina. nós já temos comércio nas nossas moedas. Agora, esse é um processo que precisamos costurar. Precisamos construir. Porque eu sonho, eu sonho que a gente tenha uma estrutura de moeda única na América do Sul de ter um parlamento da América do Sul, de ter instituições políticas na América do Sul, de ter instituições sindicais unificadas na América do Sul. Eu acho que nós estamos mudando sabe, o patamar de governança na América Latina. E pela primeira vez, os pobres estão sendo tratados como seres humanos. O resultado do avanço político na América Latina é o resultado do fortalecimento da democracia. Eu sou um otimista inveterado. Thank you. Thank you. And if you would like to say anything to uh, Hugo on the way out. My brother. This is my brother. You too. The last two presidents on my list were Raul Castro of Cuba. Oliver Stone. Hello. And Rafael Correa of Ecuador. Korea displayed his disdain for President Bush, saying U.S. policies in Latin America are directly responsible for the rise of leftist movements across the region. When Washington objected to Korea's demand that they remove their military base from his country, the new president demanded equality, an Ecuadorian military base in Miami. Bueno, creo que el presidente Chávez empezó una nueva era en América Latina. Para nosotros en estos momentos es extremadamente duro tratar de hacer los cambios que queremos hacer y que necesita el país. Ahora que hay muchos gobiernos amigos en la región, como el del presidente Chávez, el presidente Morales, de los Kirchner en Argentina, Lula da Silva en Brasil, me imagino lo duro que haber sido para él hace 10 años cuando estaba absolutamente solo en una Latinoamérica llena de gobiernos neoliberales. La principal y tal vez única influencia de Chávez es que nos dio ejemplo en muchas cosas. Uh, bueno, nosotros queremos mucho a los Estados Unidos. Yo viví, eh, estudié allá. Queremos mucho al pueblo de los Estados Unidos. Pero obviamente su política exterior es muy cuestionable. Y por eso cuando nos querían presionar para mantener una base extranjera en el suelo patrio, base extranjera que ni siquiera paga un arriendo, no paga absolutamente nada, y nos acusaban de extremistas porque no queríamos la base, si no hay problema con tener bases extranjeras en un país, pusimos una condición muy sencilla, mantendríamos la base norteamericana en Manta, siempre y cuando los norteamericanos nos permitieran poner una base ecuatoriana en Miami. Si no hay problema con bases extranjeras, nos dejarían poner la base. Bueno, lo que ellos hacen es eh, un poco de asesoría, etc., pero estamos limitando grandemente toda esa influencia que tenían, donde financiaban unidades completas de nuestra fuerza pública. Todo eso estamos cambiando. Vamos a seguir luchando contra la droga, pero independientemente. Rafael Correa is now being cast as one of the potentially bad left with Chavez and with uh, Morales. So does he see that or does he still think he's, he's a favorite of the American media? Con todo respeto, conociendo a la prensa norteamericana, estaría más preocupado cuando hable bien de mí. Good evening. The bad news on assassination plots was reported today by the Senate Intelligence Committee. The committee issued a report which says that officials of the United States government initiated plots to kill two foreign leaders, were involved in plots to kill two others, were implicated in another, and that the CIA was aware of two more murder schemes. 
Fidel Castro is alive and well despite at least eight CIA plots to kill him and one plan to undermine his image by making his beard fall out. Some of those who were the targets of assassination plots were widely known people, Che Guevara and Raul Castro, who is the brother of Fidel Castro of Cuba. In January, the revolution, 50 years, 2003, around there, with Mr. Chavez's emergence and his victory after the coup, you are the grandfather, the godfather. And what do you think Nosotros of you? fuimos acaso los primeros, pero no padrino. Todos son mayores de edad, todos caminan con sus propios pies, con sus propias ideas y aportando nuevas ideas. Por ejemplo, el socialismo del siglo XXI. How do you feel about these inheritors? Some optimism? No, son herederos de las obras nuestras. Todos somos en definitiva herederos de algo. Somos los cubanos, somos herederos de los libertadores de América. Empezando por Bolívar, Sucre, de Toussaint Louverture, el haitiano, la, la primera y única revolución triunfante dirigida por esclavos en la historia de la humanidad. Somos herederos de la lucha de más reciente de otros compañeros que han caído, como el Che Guevara, etc. Eh, algunos eran muy jóvenes, como el presidente Correa, el presidente Chávez, pero cada uno va aprendiendo de su propio acervo y del acervo del continente y de la humanidad. Esa es la realidad. Ni padrinos nosotros, ni herederos ellos. Y la revolución cubana en el medio siglo ha llegado completica a la costa. Y los cubanos, a pesar de ser de carácter explosivo, hemos aprendido a tener paciencia. Una cosa increíble. Y de la liga, la liga explosiva esa, como calificó Fidel a los europeos, nuestro tronco español, la liga es y nuestro tronco africano. Estamos listos a otros 50 años. It's six years ago, in January in 2003, we were here to do Fidel. We talked for like three days. And he was a lone wolf. He was the, he was the hold down. And the, the, the island had no advertising, no corporations. It was this throwback to another era. He actually was, a, was the mouse who roared, who fought off 50 miles away the United States for 50 years, 60 years. Like the old man in the sea. Like the old man in the sea. It's a sad story. You know, the Hemingway wrote, the old fisherman goes out, he catches this gigantic fish, which is the revolution in 1960. And of course, by the time he brings it into shore, it's been eaten by the sharks. Still. Still, the man tried, he was noble in his effort, and Hemingway gave you the, that strength of character, that beauty of loss, tragedy of effort sometimes. What I liked about Castro was that he said to us, there is a pendulum to history, these things change. And he saw in some weird way that this whole thing in 2000 was gonna shift. And I hope to God he, you know, we see the end of this predatory capitalism I think there's such a thing as, as a benign capitalism, but there's a predatory one that really destroys people, and we've seen it all our lives. Chavez is facing the same odds as uh, Castro, but I think he has more allies. He's, first of all, what impressed me about Chavez is his strength. He's a bull. He's got the same strength that Castro had when we met him in 2003. But remember how strong Castro was. He kept it up. Chavez keeps it up. What do you think of the U.S. and Chavez? That's clear. You know, he's a threat to, as much of a threat to the system as Castro was. He's a great example. If he succeeds, it'll be the first time in Latin American history, except for Castro, where he's led an entire region, practically the entire continent, away from the IMF and the United States economic controls. Soon after I returned to North America, another president appeared on the scene. If there is anyone out there who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, who still questions the power of our democracy, tonight is your answer. Ojalá Obama sea un nuevo Roosevelt. 
y Obama plantea un nuevo deal, un new deal, no solo a Estados Unidos, a, a todo el continente y al mundo. Since virtually every major international organization from the IMF to the UN Security Council is controlled to a large degree by the United States, the new Bolivarians decided to strengthen regional ties so they could talk to the United States with a single voice. This actually happened at a recent meeting of hemisphere leaders in Trinidad, where the bulk of the South Americans refused to sign any document in the absence of Cuba. This was not reported with the proper perspective in the U.S. press. Were this model to be multiplied in other continents, U.S. hegemony could be severely eroded. Talking with Chavez, good move, bad move, certainly historic, correct? My president went to Trinidad, and all I got was this lousy Che Guevara t-shirt. Barack Obama attended the Summit of the Americas in Trinidad and found the entire continent barring Colombia and Mexico ready to take him on. Who's that man laughing with President Obama and why is everybody talking about these pictures? By embracing the dictators, the bad guys, uh, the, the corrupt politicians, the, the Kirchner gang family in Argentina, a, a, uh, Danny Ortega from Nicaragua, the Western Hemisphere's senior child molester. What he's doing is he is giving credibility to America's enemies. Both our friends and our foes. Uh, will be quick to take advantage of a situation if they think they're dealing with a, a weak president. But Obama did not behave like Bush. He met Chavez, who gave him a peace offering. It's unlikely that uh, as a consequence of me shaking hands uh, or having a, a polite conversation with Mr. Chavez that we are endangering the strategic interests of the United States. In private, so I am told, the new man in Washington assured Chavez that under his administration, there would be no further destabilization attempts or any interference in the internal affairs of Venezuela. If true, this is a small step forward. I said that Obama has three things that he has to give a signal to the world. First, I blocked Cuba. There is no reason to be. Second, é trabalhar intensamente para a paz no Oriente Médio. Depois poderia convidar o Chávez para ir aos Estados Unidos? Esses 50 anos não sido em vano, por isso aí um Chávez, aí, aí em Bolívia, aí em Nicarágua, aí em Equador, Paraguai, me animo a dizer, e alguns chamados centro-esquerda, como, como Lula, é dizer, um, um grande rebelião de los pueblos contra o Império em Latinoamérica. Un mundo multilateral donde una potencia no puede decidir por todos. Hoy la hace mal a la propia potencia. Cuando usted se cree dueño del poder absoluto, es lo mismo que la política. ¿Eh? Es lo que yo siempre le digo a Hugo también, ¿eh? esto lo hablo con total objetividad. Yo tengo una gran relación con Chávez, es mi amigo. Pero le digo, construir colectivamente. Eh, en vez de ser vos el único candidato, vos tenés que tener 10 candidatos a presidente en tu espacio y en tu candidato. No podés ser el único. Vos te enfermás, te morís y terminó el proceso. Es decir, eh, creer en, en, en que, que una sola persona puede ser la garantía es lo mismo que creer que una sola potencia del mundo puede arreglar los problemas del mundo. Es decir, ¿eh? hay que the triumphalism and euphoria that existed after the collapse of the Soviet Union has virtually gone. Everyone knows that it's a more difficult world that they have to confront. The size of the Hispanic population in the United States is now larger than it's ever been. The new migrants act as a bridge with South America. The interesting question, which in my more utopian moods I sometimes ponder, is whether the changes in South America might travel across this bridge via the Hispanic populations in the United States and produce something which none of us can foresee. In Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador and Paraguay, 95% of the media networks were savagely hostile to the Bolivarians. And yet they won. There is a lesson here to be learned. I, I heard he's a big admirer of the 1770s, the Indian Revolution against Spain of Tupac Katari. The name is Julian Apaza, the apodo Tupac Katari, and salvagemente por los españoles ha sido descuartizado. Y el momento de ser descuartizado, él dijo, yo muero, un día volveré millones. 
ahora somos millones. Y quizá esa es una de las razones de, de la actividad que uno lleva, el optimismo, la fe, la esperanza ¿eh? y las evidencias concretas de que sí es posible cambiar el mundo, cambiar la historia. Es posible, Oliver. Ya, 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 ya. 